its identity. The amending power is conferred on two houses on the two houses of parliament, whose identity is clearly established by the provisions of the constitution. It must be the parliament of the sovereign democratic republic. It is not any parliament which has the amending power, but only that parliament which has been created by the constitution. In other words, it must continue to be the parliament of a sovereign and democratic republic. The institution of states must continue to exist in order that they may continue to be associated with the amending power in the cases falling under the proviso. If the respondents are right, the proviso can be completely deleted since Article 368 can be amended. This would be wholly contrary to the scheme of Article 368 itself. Scheme of 68, because two agencies are provided for amending the provisions covered by the proviso. One agency cannot destroy the other by the very exercise of the amending power. The effect of limitless amending power in relation to amendment of Article 368 cannot be conducive to the survival of the Constitution itself, Constitution, because the amending power can itself be taken away and the Constitution can be made literally unamendable by virtually unamendable or virtually unamendable by providing for an impossible majority. While examining the above contentions, it is necessary to consider the claim of the respondents that the amending power under 368 has the full, has the full constituent power. It has been suggested that on every occasion the procedure is followed as laid down in Article 368 by the two houses of parliament and the assent of the president is given, there is the reproduction of the functions of a constituent assembly. Just mark. In other words, the parliament acts in the same capacity as a constituent assembly when exercising the, the power of amendment under the said article. This is fundamental to the entire argument that I make. In other words, Parliament acts in the same capacity as the Constituent Assembly when exercising the power of amendment under the said article. This argument does not take stock of the admission made on behalf of the respondents that the entire Constitution cannot be repealed or abrogated by the amending power. Indisputably, a constituent assembly specially convened for the purpose would have the power to completely revise, repeal, or abrogate the constitution. That shows that the amending power under 368 cannot have the same powers as a constituent assembly. Even assuming that there is a reference on the nature of the power being enacted between enacting a law and making an amendment, both the powers are derived from the constitution. The amending power has been created by the constitution itself. It can only exercise those powers with which it has been invested. And if that power has limits, it can be exercised only within those limits. So you have a clear distinction between the exercise of constituent power and the exercise of legislative power, which is what I said in the beginning to your lordships. Parliament, while enacting a law, functions within the contours of the constitution. A constituent assembly has no constitution in place. It has every right to do what it likes till such time as the constitution is framed. So at no point in time in law, can a legislative assembly be converted into a constituent assembly as a matter of law? Luckily, we had no Maharaja exercising his powers with us. We had Parliament doing that. And now, even when Parliament, even when Parliament amends the Constitution, yes. it's not exercising powers as a constituent assembly. That's correct. It may be exercising a constituent power. That's correct. The power to amend, but yes. because it's a power which is restricted, you are subservient to the Constitution. That's right. That's right. And therefore, you are bound by the provisions of the Constitution by virtue of which 
your power to amend the constitution is circumscribed. That's what I said at the outset, Mullahs. That has been my submission throughout. Now, the next paragraph, Mullahs, is paragraph 620. This is at PDF page 273. This is Justice Hegde and Justice Mukherjee. 270? Uh, well, let's, uh, 273 PDF, para 620 minutes. Otherwise, well, let's see the danger of this argument. Tomorrow, well, let's parliament says that we are the constituent assembly. They can do away with basic structure. Uh, Dr. Ambedkar also spoke, spoke about it in his speech on 25th of November, 1949. I'm well, sorry, I didn't get your note. Dr. Ambedkar, yes. while presenting the final draft yes. on 25th of November 1949, yes. also spoke about this aspect. Yes, yes. I think speech. we have it, I think. We have it, I think, in volume 8. I'll just come to that. No, the point I'm making is a more fundamental point which impacts the future of, of, our, of our country. If you, in principle, say that a parliament can convert itself into a constituent assembly, then where do we go? From there. Forget about this case. I'm far more worried about our future. Parliament can never say that because that constituent assembly is a political process, which I said at the beginning. It's a political process in the context of the aspirations of all those participating in the constituent assembly as to what the state should be like. How do you meet the aspirations of the different segments of the community which have to be met and what kind of provision should be put in place? So it's, it's the genesis of the politics of the day which determines what kind of constitution we want, which is why when you talk about diversity, when you talk about minorities, we talk about, about Dalits, we talk in our constitution, what were we faced with? In 1947, what were we faced with? We were faced with a situation where disparate communities, diverse communities, different religions, different races came together to be part of the Union of India. And their aspirations had to be met. So you had provisions for the Dalits, you have provisions for the minorities. You had provisions dealing with reservations, your scheduled caste, the scheduled tribes. That's a political process. That's why our constitution is what it is. Unlike mothers, as I told in Europe, it was an entirely different process. Here we were, it was an amalgamation of colors to be united as one, which is the Tiranga. That's, that's what, what it is. You can't convert a legislative assembly into that process. But equally, Mr. Sibyl, to completely divorce the power of amendment from the political process inherent in the amending power. Yes, of course. Would not be appropriate because yes. There is no, there is no strict dichotomy in that sense Absolutely. between the exercise of the constituent power itself being traceable to the political process and the power of a constituent assembly being entirely political in its nature. The constituent power itself of parliament to amend the constitution is a political power. I agree entirely. Absolutely right. We're not saying you can't amend. Because it's not our case. You can. But when parliament amends according to you, yes. It is not exercising the powers of a constituent assembly. That's all that I'm saying. That's all that I'm saying. It's not converting itself. And then it has to function within the constitution of India. I'll come to that later. We're at a stage, mothers, where a CO is issued. The which... constituent assembly is untrammeled. That's right. It's as if it is working on a clean slate. That's correct. Absolutely. Absolutely, mothers. And it say, the judgment says so, mothers. That is not bound by anything. Bound by the, the, the representatives of the constituent assembly who have common aspirations to draft a constitution for the future of the people of the country. 
which is why diversity, protection are fundamental to our constitution. For this reason, this very reason. So you want to take away that, that's very dangerous. 